Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am joined today by the one, the only, Yatsu. Welcome to the show. It's such an honor to have you on. I'm a big fan of your work, and especially the stuff that you've been doing as of the last few years is truly groundbreaking and revolutionary, and I can't wait to have this, this chat with you. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Cool, cool. So um, just, just I got to ask, because you're, you know, like, Typically on the show, I'm interviewing like physicists or movie directors or writers. Um, but, you know, and, and I have a few crypto folks in the mix as well. But is this the first time that you're being interviewed by a board ape? Uh, yes, I would say it's a pretty unique experience. I, I kind of love it, though. <laughs> All right. Cool, cool. So, yeah, you know, one, one, one thing that I've been wondering, because so many of your interviews that are out there, and I, I highly suggest you guys uh, go check out all of the amazing interviews that Yacht ha has, has given, some real cool insights into the world that we're getting into. But I'm very intrigued to know about your early days, about how you fell in love with video games, or kind of what's your video game story? Well, my video game story started a very, very long time ago. And I would say even before we were interacting with uh, sort of computers or even the VCS, I was playing, you know, with these uh, the Trickotronics by Nintendo, mm. the very original ones. So those are the little devices in which I sort of found a lot of time to entertain myself, uh, and also arcades, right? So <clears throat> in the seventies, you know, I, I was a child of the seventies. Uh, basically, you know, I was spending a lot of time playing in these sort of coin coin ops where you would put in some money and you would actually play games as well, you know, early <laughs> right. versions of Pong. So that was kind of how I grew up. Wow. All right. So so I'm I'm really dating myself a little bit here. Um, the the other thing also is, uh, you know, um, I grew up in Vienna in Austria. Mm. Uh, that in itself wasn't a very sort of, you know, let's say techno-friendly place because it was very classic and somewhat conservative. Yeah, but I'm also, place. yeah, but very beautiful, absolutely. Um, but I'm also an only child, right? So in some ways you could say, if I think back of it as an only child, you know, one of the ways in which I sort of entertained myself was through the digital space that was available to me. Sure. Right? Whereas perhaps if I had maybe sort of a lot of siblings or something, they would all have kept me busy in other ways. So I think there's both the circumstance and the situation in which I found myself. And then I was generally drawn. I mean, which kid doesn't like video games? I actually can't think of many kids in the world that given the opportunity to play video games, whatever generation they were, wouldn't actually want to do that. So, you know, my interest in the space really started organically from being entertained by it, really. And um, do you remember what the game was that, like, gave you that inspiration? Because, like, when... when 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 I was a kid and I played, you know, for me it was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. It was this game by LucasArts back in the day um, that was able to really do a, a, an amazing job in telling a story. And I was like, that's when it all clicked to me. Like, wow, storytelling in video games as a medium is a really powerful device. Was there that one game that you remember saying, okay, this is the game that's inspiring me to potentially try to make this a career? So, you know, I didn't enter the gaming space as, uh, as or the tech space, as it were, you know, through games, I, actually, right? So I, mm. I loved I, I loved games, but I didn't, you know, it started with music, really, because I had a music oh, wow. background. And what happened was, is that, um, you know, so my parents were professional musicians. And so they made me study music in Vienna, which was extremely competitive and certainly oh, humbled. Yeah. It certainly humbled me a lot in the sense that I certainly right. understood what true talent was like. And yeah, I was not, yeah. I was not that. Right. Right. So it's, like I, playing, it's like playing football in Ohio. It's like, yeah. yeah. Music in Vienna. Yeah, That's yeah. right. It was tough. Right. Uh, but you know, I ended up basically uh, using a computer at the time that I had was an Atari ST and had MIDI sure. ports. And I basically made uh, MIDI software uh, took an early version of that that basically allowed me to compose faster than my peers, wow. which is basically like like you know like a calculator in math, right? Really, if you think about it. And um, you know, my teachers were not amused because basically they thought I was cheating. Um, but right. I got appreciation for the software on a pre-internet service called CompuServe, mm. and so people basically started saying, "Hey, we like the software." And then over, you know, in, in due course, people started sending me money as well, you know, in, in the mail, which is kind of how people used to set sort of reward software developers by literally sending checks in the mail. And that eventually led me to be discovered by Atari. So my, my, my sort of the beginning of that didn't really start off in, 
I love to play games and we get into an industry because in the 80s, there wasn't really a gaming industry per se. And also in Austria, there were no gaming studios that I could work for anyway. And sure. I was a kid. I just kind of morphed into that space. And then when I was working at Atari, then I got involved in sort of the world of first in multimedia and then in gaming. And sort of one of the sort of last devices that I had the privilege or maybe misfortune, I don't know which way you want to look at it, mm. uh, working on was the Jaguar. Mm. Right, and the Jaguar was sort of Atari's last attempt to basically be a console player yeah, back yeah, in the yeah. early days as a sort of quasi 32 bit player or 64 bit player to be precise, um, you know, to compete with you know Sega and Nintendo. Um, anyway, that was that was sort of that. So, I, I wouldn't say even though I loved games, it wasn't the one game that said, Oh my goodness, I, I sure, sure, this. I just so, kind of morphed into it. Yeah, your, your entry point was this kind of fascination with. Um, the Atari ST and MIDI and understanding the engineering side. So back then, obviously, engineers were were a hot commodity or a rare commodity. Mm. And you got your insight through that. So did, did you ever work with, um, with um, oh, my God, I can't, I keep thinking Bruno Bonnell, but not Bruno Bonnell, the original founder of Atari. Uh, um, oh, Nolan Bushnell? No. Nolan Bushnell. It no, sounds so, familiar. Yeah, yes. it sounds, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it so no. So, so, so Nolan, uh, he was, so what happened was, is if you look at the history of Atari, he built Atari, the coin up machines. In fact, I think there's even, the, you know, the story that Steve Jobs used to have sort of work there for a little bit as well that yes. was not my generation i would probably have to be born in the 60s to have experienced that right so i'm gotcha, a little bit gotcha. too late however uh, he ended up selling it to warner mm. and then actually warner kind of made a mess of it all and then they sold it to you know atari had many histories and then they ended up selling it to the tremils uh, and the interesting story for those who follow a little bit of computer history is the Tremils had just basically come out of a very acrimonious relationship uh, with the with the shareholder or the primary shareholder uh, who was running another company called Commodore. Oh, God, and my if, favorite. Yeah, so if you remember back in the day, there were the Atari Commodore Wars, right? And yeah. it really started because, uh, you know, um, sort of the, the Tremils basically had built, really built up a sort of Commodore and what was the Commodore 64. And then with this new um, new technology, the the, the you know which was the Commodore Amiga, there was this amazing technology which became one of the biggest you know PC gaming stations back in the eighties. Oh 80s, my God! Right, I, if you if you remember, of course, <laughs> and and of course. and that so there was this fast reaction to basically sort of compete with that with the with what became the Atari ST, um, and and uh, and with the sort of some of the original engineers of the Commodore sixty four, right? So they actually had similar roots around that, and so he basically acquired. I guess the what would have been considered fairly defunct assets of Atari in a very shrewd business move, and then really began what you know for people in the '80s were sort of the early forms of the of the computer wars between you know Amiga and 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 uh, and Atari. You know, yeah. what, that's, those were the old days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were the good old days. And similar to you, um, I was obsessed with the idea of of being able to work with the Amiga. I couldn't afford one. I had a Commodore 64, so I was familiar with the Amiga. I um, I I didn't, you know, I couldn't afford it because at the time it was an expensive machine. Yeah. So I, I actually went to a local television station in Miami where I grew up, and I told them that I knew how to use the software Video Toaster. Yes, though, yes, That's right. even, even though I did not know how to use a software Video Toaster. And then, like, you know, when I got to the interview, they were like, here's the Amiga. Can you show me how to do video toaster? And I knew enough about reading all like the stuff in like, you know, like a uh, Commodore magazine and, and, and all that stuff that I was able to actually, you know, kind of fool my way around it enough where I got a job <laughs> editing for this television station on the video toaster because nobody else knew how to use it. So, <laughs> so yeah. And then of course, when nobody was looking, I would install you know, Defender of the Crown. By oh Cinemaware. my goodness! That's a that was one of the first. Actually, I played that on the Commodore sixty four. In fact, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was that was a classic. And then, of course, Atari ST had a version as well. But yeah, the, the Amiga always was superior in terms of its graphics and its capabilities. But we were sort of you know back then it was really passionate. It's almost like if you were you know an, 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 a Commodore Amiga guy, you just simply couldn't cross over to the Atari side and vice versa. It was you know almost religious in terms right. of the passions that people had. It was. Kind of, as you say, the good old days. <laughs> yeah, and like, it's really interesting that you say that, actually, because at that age, I learned one of the most important lessons in my life. Um, and my grandfather for Christmas said, hey, I'm going to buy you a console, you know, this year for Christmas. And, um, you know, 
it was either the S, you know, uh, the the NES or the Sega Master System, right? Like that was the choice, and like I kept on going either or, like you know, NES. I kept on going back and forth, back and forth at Toys R Us, and my grandfather told me something I'll never forget. That's probably the most important thing I've ever learned in my life, which is that he said it's not. He said it in Spanish, but it's not about either or. It's about both and. Mm. And he surprised me, and he bought me both of them. Wow, you that's know. A- so ever since then, I've always had both, never yes. one or the other. It's always yes. both, you know? Yes. So, awesome. you know, very important thing that it's not about picking sides. Sometimes it's about learning about everything. Yep. You know, Agreed. so, okay, so cool. So um, how, how what, what, what was that transition like between working at a, at a company like Atari that, you know, that was such a big brand name and kind of evolving into an entrepreneur. How, how, how did your entrepreneur story kind of get started? So the entrepreneur started really when Atari went bust, or at least went bust in the format that we knew, right? Mm-hmm. The, basically what happened was through some corporate engineering, I think I think the Tremils basically just um, sort of threw, up, threw in the towel and said, you know, this is not going to work for us. And basically um, sold themselves off to uh, a hard drive company. I think it was called JTS. Anyway, mm-hmm. it was a bit of a shock, right? At that point... I was actually studying in the US because I didn't have a formal computer science education. And they said, oh, hey, you need to sort of, you know, brush up on your sort of CS skills because we didn't have that in Austria. I said, sure, no problem. So halfway through when I was basically studying and working, it was like, oops, my, my, my employer <laughs> is no longer here. What do I do, right? And they dissolved the office in, in Europe, basically headquartered in Germany, uh, which is basically where, you know, the sponsorship came from. Everything was just a mess, right? Sure. So, so that was, you know, back then, you know, how do you become an entrepreneur? Well, in most cases, because you're unemployed. And that's basically what happened to me. We basically formed a company, six of us, to really support the infrastructure of really on the media side for ex-Atari people. And if you remember back then, if you buy a computer, you don't swap it out every six to 12 months, right? Right, you, right. You, you keep it for a very long time and yeah. you want support and nobody was able to provide support. So we ended up basically providing a, a form of software and services support by updating software, by creating patches, by oh, wow. by, by doing stuff where you kind of like a, kind of like a, like a, like, I guess like a, like a like a like a plumbing service for your Atari computer, if you will. And, right, right, and then, right. And then you need some new software upgrades. We would build software that was mostly sort of visual arts related, uh, and and that was the beginning of that virtual career, shall we say, as that career, um, as, as an entrepreneur. And what was interesting at that point in time is that actually I had only really met one person in that company in person. Everyone oh. else. We communicated wow. entirely over CompuServe and then eventually Genie because, you know, travel was expensive and long distance calls were just not feasible because it's just super oh, yeah, expensive yeah. back know. then, right? You charge by the minute, right? So it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, so we started that business um, and then eventually it morphed into, you know, Atari was going to be a declining business. So it was good in the beginning, but, you know, long term it wasn't going to work because nobody's making new Atari computers. So you're not going to get any new customers. And as you may also recall, that's when PCs started to really emerge, right? Right, and the at 286. That point, yeah, exactly. And then eventually 386s and 486s, yeah. and then you had better graphics. And at that point, the you know the 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 you know, none of the old computers that we knew, you know, the Amiga and or even new renditions of it could compete. And so we ended up basically sort of um, moving over to basically building uh, tools on SGI. Mm. And what was interesting is because we had expertise in 3D graphics and rendering, we basically built OpenGL modelers. And what that meant was wow. that we basically had a way in which we could create a 3D model, um, you know, in uh, in OpenGL, which was then used as a as a platform for you know for SGI called VRML, so Virtual Reality Markup Language. It was kind of, yeah, yeah, of course, SGI. I remember it well. Yeah, SGI's answer to HTML to say we're going to go shopping online oh. in VR with these line graphics that look like Tron. Oh, I remember <laughs> it. I remember it. I'm I'm one of those guys that told everybody in my studio, hey, let's let's get into VRML. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So this was in the early '90s, right? And um, and so we built basically one of the very first modeling tools that basically oh, would output in VRML, which eventually led us to be being acquired by SGI. And and um, because you know back then SGI was really trying to c- compete as being the next internet machine, and you know because they were losing out to Sun Microsystems, and so they bought many companies and cobbled them together in what is you know was known as SGI Webforce. Wow. Uh, and so this was one of the many components that made SGI Webforce, and they basically you know uh, acquired us. And since I was the only sort of that was also my first sort of entry into Asia because as the only Asian member of the team. 
They're like, hey, you know, you're Asian, <laughs> international business plan. Let's go. Let's go to Asia. I'm like, uh, sure, no problem. I don't care. I'm single and I'm like, you know, unattached. So let's go. And my first posting was Japan. So that's kind of how how that wow. all started. Um, and that's then fascinating. I had no idea that that that's quite the journey. Did you already speak uh, Japanese? When no, 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 no. I grew up in Austria. German is my mother tongue. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously I have an Asian heritage, but you know, if you know anything about history, the, the, it's not a likely thing to send a Chinese ethnic person to Japan, right? It's, but, it <laughs> right, right, but, right. but it didn't matter, right? It was more like, you know, that was, that was how the world was, right? In terms of, and you know, it's crazy to think that at the time, sending someone overseas, even as developed as Japan or Hong Kong was at the time, uh, was considered hazardous. Right, so sure. nobody nobody wanted to go. So I was the only one who was like, "Sure, let's go." Right, and so anyway, I went to Japan for a few months. You know, I trained people on how to use the software. Then I went to um, Taiwan, and then I ended up being in Hong Kong, and mm. that was kind of interesting because in Hong Kong, I uh, I was sort of doing what I was doing before, but I couldn't get my email because there wasn't a CompuServe node. And that was kind of like, and at that point, AOL was really sort of you know becoming all the rage in the U.S. And I, you know, I thought, well, you know what? Because I have, uh, because my father's from Hong Kong, I ended up getting a Hong Kong permanent identity card, which basically meant that I have the right of abode and I could live there and I didn't need a visa. So I thought, you know, why don't I stay here and build, you know, a, one of the very first internet service providers in Hong Kong? Oh, wow. And that was kind of how that all started. And um, and I think, uh, you know, it was it was really hard as a business because nobody wanted internet. It was like I felt like it was selling sort of fridges to Eskimos because <laughs> because because it was like what I need this for, you know. Right. And also, it was a remarkably underwhelming experience when you actually got to see it, right? Um, and I was remember I remember you know we were using Mosaic browsers before we went moved on to Netscape, right? It was all very very primitive. But for me, it was just kind of natural. It was like, hey, this is the place we want to be. I was playing multi-user dungeon games. I was on MUDs. I was I was setting up my own IRC chats, right? I was doing all this stuff and and I was making relationships and connections and friends in those spaces. Um, but of course, all of us were equally broke. So we couldn't really support each other in terms of you know, building the business. Uh, so on one hand, we had this sort of you know community that was really forming and growing. On the other hand, it was almost impossible to commercialize it, right? That's incredible. Um, but yeah, that's how my entrepreneurial journey started. And you know, fast forward a little bit, basically. Sure. You know the dot. You know the dot com wave basically became really, really a big thing in the U.S. And there were a number of U.S. companies at that point who were really trying to sort of acquire traffic, and mm -hmm. it was getting expensive. This was we're talking now ninety seven, ninety eight type of thing. Yeah. And so they they um, they looked for companies, and at that point we had three hundred thousand users, you know, on our sort of you know at that point we were not really an ISP anymore. We were more like a sort of a GeoCities equivalent, but for Asia. And at uh, this point, at this point, uh, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I, at this point, you're the CEO of the company? Well, I'm the founder of the company. I never gave sure. myself, I never gave myself a CEO title. Gotcha. Um, that happened much, much later. Um, and frankly, it was also a little bit like, you know, I, I felt almost a little bit sort of an imposter syndrome in terms of how could I possibly be a CEO at like, you know, 20 or 21 or whatever age I was at the time and then later on. So I never called myself CEO, even with uh, companies that I had formed there thereafter. I didn't actually give myself an executive title until sure. maybe when I hit my 30s. So, but, you know, but anyway, um, they acquired the business. You know, um, what was interesting there is I got some money. I didn't get all the money I thought I could get <laughs> because the whole thing just kind of, you know, the whole dot com thing sort of blew up. But it allowed yeah. me to um, get uh, sort of some money to build what was now what was now known as Outplays, which is really an early cloud computing platform, yeah, um, yeah. you know, for email. And that kind of really was sort of, you know, the 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 basis of sort of building a business that ultimately ended up getting acquired by by IBM uh, almost a decade later. To um, yeah. Yeah. Is that something because I've been very lucky in my entrepreneurial career, nothing, nothing to the scale of what you're, you know, you've done, but in my own context, it's, you know, I'm proud of my achievements. And, um, you know, one of the things that I always tell young entrepreneurs when I meet them is that when, when you have a business that to really think of that, you know, exit strategy, you know, like, like if you're going to build something, know, know what the exit is, unless you're committing to it for the rest of your life. Um, which is an option as well. Is that something that you learned or is that something that just kind of happened naturally or, or were you conscious about the idea of building value that's attractive to other industries? So I never thought of it in terms of exit uh, originally. Uh, and I would say I still don't 
because it's like if I was thinking about building it for exit, let's say my very first internet service provider business, is, which is called Hong Kong Online, by the way. So mm -hmm. it just gives it, and I was able to get the trademark and registrations for that too. Gives That's you an cool. idea of how early that was. Uh, I probably wouldn't have built that business. Right. Because logically speaking, you know, when I was setting up um, an ISP in Hong Kong, market demand was close to zero, awareness was low. It was like it was like you know like the, the earliest of fringes of the innovator stage, which right. you know typically is the Death Valley. And so, actually, if I was thinking logically, you know, I would have had a much better business if I actually started an ISP probably four years later, right? Right. Just because because right. timing matters in these matters. But for me, it was more like it just felt right for me. It was like, hey, this is the space I'm excited in. So I started building in the space, and that's kind of how I started doing this. So everything I do, I I did, and I do has been a commitment as if I would do it forever. Right. And but then, you know, you 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 get savvy, you look at the market, you look at circumstances. So, you know, when Outblaze was sold to IBM, it wasn't because we were planning to sell it to IBM. IBM actually sure. came to us. What happened was is at that point the market was consolidating, right? You know, Gmail was everywhere. You know, Microsoft had just launched 360 online. You know, we were still one of the largest independent email service providers, but you had to look at the reality and say, okay, we offer these inter enterprise services to, you know, at that point, like ISPs in the US, like Verizon and Juno Online and all those, you know, register to common network solutions, many of them that are not around anymore, right? right? And we're we're sort of like, okay, where do we find ourselves? And then IBM needed a solution to combat essentially the growth in sort of sort of you know cloud applications. And so we were sort of the 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 natural fit. But there wasn't really many other buyers out there necessarily as well, right? So we, so I would say again, you know, we were lucky to an extent, but also, you know, we didn't build it out for an exit, at least in, in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's partially also because the the region, Hong Kong, where where we built the business, wasn't really a VC friendly place. Interesting. Um, even though there's a lot of capital here, it's not really for technology investing. You don't normally hear about too many tech companies emerging out of Hong Kong, certainly from that generation, because you also had a much more attractive and sexier neighbor that was China, right? right. So if you're, if you're going to invest in technology, why would you invest it in Hong Kong? You invested in China, the chances of returns and success are much greater, right? So, so that was kind of you know, all of these things that you learn later on. Um, so I would say that we have to be, of course, uh, market aware and we have to mm. sort of go roll with the punches and maybe you have to be opportunistic in terms of where things are just to make sure that you're you sort of are and you need to be somewhat paranoid as to where the market is so you have to be always on your toes but i you know our, my philosophy certainly hasn't been to build towards an exit and but but it ends up happening and sometimes like you know, when when the first generation of Animoca was built, you know I you know um, you know after IBM was sold, uh, I sold the business to IBM. You know we had a non compete in enterprise. Mm -hmm. We basically sort of and we had actually a gaming business in our place, which is doing MMO games and console games. So that eventually really? became yeah that was so we did sort of our most infamous title was a game called Hello Kitty Online. <laughs> Ooh, can, I never heard about that one. I never. Yeah. Heard, I love anyway, MMOs. I never heard about yeah, that. Anyway, one. Hello Kitty Online is one of those games that a lot of people joke about because they're like, wait, that's uh, you know, why would you turn Hello Kitty? Into sort of you know like a World of Warcraft. That's kind of how the connections people made back when we were looking at hyper casual. This is like in 2005 and 2006 or something like a long right. time ago. Anyway, sort of fast forward a little bit. We ended up uh, we had a gaming division, and IBM was like, I don't know what to do with the gaming division. We're not in that space. So we carved it out and sold the enterprise assets to uh, IBM and kept the gaming piece. And with that, we actually ended up basically moving very quickly into mobile games and free to play. Um, and sort of, uh, you know, became one of the biggest players in 2011, you know, before we got deplatformed from the App Store, which is another story altogether. But, <laughs> right, it sounds like an interesting yeah. one. But 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 one of the things that happened, and I guess this is just how I operate, is that yeah. around 2014, 2015, Animoca Brands, you know, basically spun out of what was the original Animoca, which is the gaming piece that I was just talking about, and. Um, and started going into you know sort of kids gaming, which was very difficult. At mm. that point, I honestly I was a little disillusioned from the gaming industry myself. So I was there, but I was actually no longer operating the business. I, I actually went into ed tech. Um, I, I was I, I helped build a school. I built a learning lab. I had young children too. That that certainly has influenced my decision making. But sure. I think the one thing that got me in the gaming space was. You know what attracted me was you know to to you know the fact that it was fun and entertaining and we bring joy to people and what it became and this is around 2014 2015 what it became mm -hmm. was really a business about how to extract as much money from the player as possible sure. and it became very exploitative actually and it was and on top of the exploitation 
we were no longer building games that were best for the users. We were right. building games that were best for the platform. Yeah, Basically, yeah, yeah. you know, Apple was like, oh, we have an AR feature. We'd like you to build that feature because if you don't, well, maybe we can't feature you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> sure, like, sure. like, you know, and, and of course they don't say it that way, but it's implied, right? And so our entire marketing effort and our entire relationship literally became around offering, you know, and bearing gifts to the king, right? Mm. And I was like, wait a second, you know, I, you know, I, I, I entered the internet space. I built ISPs. I was, we were one of the biggest open source deployments, you know, back in the Outplays days, back in the sort of late 90s and early 2000s. And this was all supposed to be open, right? You know, AOL mm. failed. Even the Chinese inter, sort of Chinese internet that was supposed to be closed ended up having to allow for open source and, you know, sort of that information to flow in and out, right? So, so open was supposed to win. And then here mm. we are living in these closed ecosystems, trying to extract as much value out of the users without That's giving anything true. back. And so, so, so while I didn't understand exactly, I didn't have an answer to this, but it felt draining. Like it just, it, and, and so I guess, again, it felt like this is not where I want to be. This doesn't make sense. So I, I became a director of the company in a sort of a non-executive role, which is why for a long time I had a non-executive capacity for a couple of years and started going into education and learning and learned a whole mm. bunch of new things that actually really have informed sort of my view of where the world is going from my perspective. But it helped me sort of, I guess, uh, find myself a little bit in terms of, you know, where I think the world needs to go. I, I was working with children and all that. You know, it's a completely different perspective. Uh, and um, and then, you know, when we, when, when it through actually what was originally a personal investment, um, you know, in the company called Fuel Powered, that was mm. basically sharing an office with another company called Axiom Zen, building this little thing called CryptoKitties. Oh, um, wow. Right? Wow, that, you were, oh my God. Yeah. I, that, I did not know that piece of the story. Yeah. That is, that is, uh, that is when sort of sparks started flying, right? And we're just like, oh, this is interesting, right? And, you know, and, and that's kind of when everything started coming about, like we could reconstruct everything through the way it should be through this paradigm because we can really own our digital assets. And so, so, so really the Animoca brands, you know, today was effectively born from that moment, which is basically late 2017. So, so, um, you know, obviously I've been, you know, I bought my first, uh, Bitcoin, um, when it was $9 in, uh, 2013. So Congratulations. I've been around. Yeah, so so I've been around, you know, from from you know from the not from the beginning, but early on, and you know when when I bought Ethereum, I bought Ethereum very early as well, and everybody was looking for that Ethereum use case that actually had uh, you know liquidity of users to it, and when we all realized, I think that the only one that had any real usage was CryptoKitties. I think is when Ethereum had that first big crash. Because it's like everybody had all these ICOs, but ultimately only crypto kitties had users, you know, and yeah. and that's what I tried. You know, I pitched Star Trek on an NFT game. I pitched everybody on an NFT game back in those days because I was like, NFTs are the way to go. And, you know, fast forward two years later, now NFTs are like, you know, everything. Um, but but so first of all, I'm blown away because. You were um, early on CryptoKitties, but you're also early on on Axie Infinity, correct? Yes, weren't you the correct. first lead lead investor? We were the first lead investor in Axie. That's correct. Yeah, which which is you know which is mind blowing thing. And for folks that you know aren't super familiar with Axie Infinity, I believe Axie Infinity has the higher level of usage when it comes to any NFT game uh, out there in terms of like being the quote unquote uh, World of Warcraft um, game in terms of its actual player base is quite substantial. Um, how how did you know? Like, how did you spot that Axie had a lot of potential? Like, like what what were some of those hallmarks? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, when we started building in the space, which is late 2017, and you know, obviously, you know, 2018, there weren't a lot of us building, <laughs> as you probably know, right? Yeah, yeah. And we were we were literally an echo chamber of people drinking our own Kool Aid you know, very desperate to sort of validate that we actually think we're right. <laughs> because yeah, obviously, yeah. I wish I would have had a sip of that Kool-Aid. I wish I would have had right. this conversation with you back then. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, and and so we we really sort of, if you think about it, we're a very small, tight-knit community of people who knew each other, right? Mm. And, you know, that led ultimately to our construction. At that point, we were a publicly list company in Australia. And, you know, when, when, when we decided this is the future of gaming and this is the future, you know, where we think the whole internet should be going, we should double down. 
we made a conscious decision that we can't be the ones that control it. In fact, it would be antithetical to the principles mm. of you know blockchain or what we now define as Web3 or the open metaverse. Instead, we, we have to basically help build these businesses. And that led us basically to acquiring the sandbox, to investing in Axie Infinity mm. or in Sky Mavis, into OpenSea, into you know Wax, Decentraland, you know, right. Bitski, and like all these companies. Most of these investments were in 2018 and 2019. So very, right. very early on, uh, because, and these are all seed companies. These were all startups that had like five or 10 people or something, right? Sure, sure. And now what was it particularly about, you know, the Sky Mavis team in Vietnam that was att attractive to us? Well, one, they're passionate about what they're building. Mm -hmm. um, two, uh, they they came from a CryptoKitties background in the sense that they were trading and playing CryptoKitties and, and saw oh, the potential, interesting. right? Interesting. So that's, that was their inspiration, but they wanted to basically build a CryptoKitties that had sort of, you know, real utility as opposed to just CryptoKitties for collecting. Sure. Um, so that was that was another part of that, uh, and then, and then I think their per, their perception and their perspective of the world was one that we shared, which is about open frameworks and decentralization and all these things, which by the way, not everyone shared. Certainly at that point in time, right? Sure. Um, because to build in you know what we now describe as Web three is very different than to be trading in it, and the world right. in 2018 and 2019 was still dominated by crypto traders who were there for speculation, and so they didn't care about DEXs, they didn't care really about the principles of what it meant to build on sort of an, an open sort of decentralized ledger. It was more like, you know, how much money can I make? And therefore trading on exchanges like Binance or Coinbase, that was really where they were, but they didn't really understand what was happening. It was really just about making a quick buck. Those were the people like the, you know, the people who were building Sandbox or people who were building, you know, um, Axie Infinity or OpenSea or so on. You know, they were really working through a time when our industry was probably on its knees, right? right. You know, Bit Bitcoin was three thousand dollars. Ether was below a hundred, right? Right, right. Everyone, everyone was running away from you know fungible tokens, and then here we are saying, "Have you heard of non fungible ones? They trade right. less, <laughs> and you should you should invest in this, right?" Right, right. <laughs> it's it seems sort of sort of very strange uh, that someone should be interested in this, and and so it was. Very few were, so we were a small club of people. So and 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 I would say that. You know, interests attract counterparties, right? You yeah. know, if, if so, it's it's not like we we sought out them. We sought each other out, right? Because we were, mm. you know, we 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 were in conferences and we would just meet with each other, or we would connect to people who were connected to us because we were all kind of similar thinking of the space, and we were only hundreds of people at the time, so it was very easy. Today, that's different, right? Today, you know, it seems like every other day or every day, new NFT gaming projects are emerging. Sure. It's harder to determine sort of, you know, what the motivations are. But certainly, you know, in 2018, 2019, if you were building in this space, you had to be a hardcore believer. You had to be passionate about this because it wasn't right. about making money right now. Because if you were going to try to make money, you could do it in different ways easier. Right, right. It wasn't the manifest destiny of like, oh, you know, let's 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 mint a bunch of NFTs and say that, you know, we have a, a metaverse game, you know, like that's a very interesting point. And I want to reflect on that for a second just for myself. But basically what I'm hearing is that the the kind of filtration that you went through to make all these investments, which really based on a on an underlying philosophy of wanting to create. Uh, value for the user versus the concept of extracting value, which was the whole thing about social gaming, you know, with microtransactions, you know, these two kind of trends that were going on, you know, just before this era kind of started. Mm -hmm. um, and you were trying to really find philosophically people that were trying to engineer uh, gaming uh, 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 products that were about like creating value for the user, which, which is... Yeah, which is actually very, very, you know, you know, interesting. And um, to me, it's actually my favorite thing about the space is, um, you know, I was a big World of Warcraft player. I was a big uh, Star Wars Galaxies player. And I paid like $800 for my Jedi. Yes, I did buy a Jedi, you know, but I got very good at using it. But I'm not going to lie. I did buy a Jedi. And I paid like 800 bucks for a Jedi once. And... I had friends that would also buy Jedi, but then they got busted, and then, and then you know, you know, they would get like blacklisted from ever playing the game again. Same thing with you know Warcraft, right? If That's right. You bought gold from WowGold.com or whatever, and they caught you. You would get your account banned. You would have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. um, where, where it's like now, the idea is no. We actually are encouraging the concept that you know something that you say, and I'm paraphrasing a quote from you. 
that it's not about renting the gaming experience. It's about actually owning uh, the gaming experience. And to me, that is a paradigm shift um, that, you know, Godzilla's out of the cage. It's like, you That's know, right. sooner or later, that will overtake the entire industry. And I'm glad. Yes. And, you know, one interesting anecdote on this is, when we launched, so we became publishers of CryptoKitties and also investors very early, right? And one of the partnerships in 2018 that we did, which was, if you think about it, very forward thinking, maybe too early, uh, was a partnership with HTC where we bundled CryptoKitties with a blockchain phone at the time, right? Oh, nice. And, and uh, you know, that, that phone obviously, you know, didn't do as well as perhaps, you know, we had hoped, but that's the industry at the time. But yeah. what was fascinating is, you know, when they said, okay, well, we need to pair at least two CryptoKitties because you have to breed, right? And we're like, okay, so just send us a CryptoKitties. Well, you know, we can't we can't just send it to you. We have to buy it on market, right? What do you mean we have to buy it on market? Because we can't just produce it. And right. it was, at that point, it was like roughly $15 per pair of CryptoKitties, which right. basically would add $15 of cost to the phone, right? It was kind of, it, it was interesting where, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. having these conversations to say, and then who do you buy those from? We don't buy it. We don't make it. We buy it from the other players who had already bred these crypto kitties, right? Sure. So, so that was and and really, we had to listen and co collaborate with our players from day one, because they were the asset owners and we were building experiences for them, uh, versus you know we control everything and we decide your destiny thereafter and forever. Yeah, that's fascinating. What one thing that I um I, I, I've really been impressed with listening to your talks online. Is is your way to articulate these ideas that people, you know, throw around like buzzwords, like you know, the way people use the word love or freedom or or peace, you know, like they have no idea what it, what any of those things mean. How would you define Web three? Web three to me is the Internet of Ownership, I would say, in a very simple term. And I think the foundation of Web three comes with the fact that we have true digital property rights. Mm -hmm. The foundation of digital property rights means that we can now freely and openly compose on top of the ownership of others, which is how human invention and innovation has always taken place. Right? It is also the reason how we defend our democracies, actually, if you think mm -hmm. about it. right? And why was a democracy even created in the first place? Because it was essentially a revolt of the kings and queens out there who basically ruled mm -hmm. our life. And so we needed to have a framework that allowed us to essentially have the majority interest protected to the benefit of all. Because what ultimately happens is that if a small group of people get to benefit, maybe not in the beginning, as they say, you know, maybe some of the first kings and dictators are benevolent. But as it goes over generations, right, right, right. ultimately what happens is, is that power corrupts, right? Because right, you no longer, you no longer um, think about sort of the interest of the majority that actually may have even brought you here. You're thinking simply about protecting your particular interest and the interest of the minority, which in the past might be the nobility or the landowners or whatever you mm. want to call it, right? And usually that ends up creating an unequal outcome, which, you know, repeats itself in history, typically in the forms of revolution and other sort of unfortunate outcomes, because people say enough, because at the end of the day, you can't suppress the majority forever, right? So that's kind of, you know, um, and property rights is the defensive mechanism around this because it keeps uh, everything honest and open, but also it's the reason and it's the engine of growth. If I can't own a house, then I can't get a mortgage for 20 or 30 years, for instance, right? Yeah. If I, you know, and if we don't all own cars, for instance, in a decentralized private way, then the business of an Uber or Lyft cannot be created, right? Because mm. I have to seek permission from Tesla or from Volkswagen to be able to do that. And what's interesting also is that the framework of owning is actually the reason why economies become greater and bigger. It's the new innovation angle. If you look at the sales of the car, it's actually a small part of the automotive industry. The automotive industry, when you include you know, the construction of roads or parking lots or the fuel or the gas stations or the drivers that are hired or Uber or Lyft or you know, car wash companies, like if you include the industry that sort of makes automotives work, it's multiple times larger than the sale of the car itself. Mm. So which means we've added layers of new experiences and innovation on top. And we can do that because we have ownership. I can do it on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. 
you know, the fact that I can own an iPhone allows for a case to five business to emerge that I can basically decorate the phone or have headphones right. or headsets, right? If if I have to seek permission every time from Apple to do that, what's Apple going to do? They're going to say, well, if you want to put a headphone that works with Apple, I got to charge you 30%, right? right and right. by the way, I don't like that design. That doesn't look good. I got to approve it first, like every other app I approve. Sure. Therefore, please make sure it's got nice sort of Apple logos and it has to be white or, you know, whatever it is, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And anytime, any environment where you have, you know, where everything is permissioned, you know, innovation basically stifles. And there's a parallel in real life. A, a country that has strong property rights that is protected, right, in this case through law, is a very strong economy. The GDPs are higher. In the mm. countries where property rights are not defended uh, or don't exist, they become like North Korea, <laughs> basically places that have sure. that, that 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 are have very low GDPs and and very low rights overall. And I go to the next point, which is that when you own something, as a as an end user, as a, as a, as an individual, then you care to protect it and you care mm. to invest in it. It's 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 like emotionally, it's like if I rent a house, how much would I invest in it? You know, I, I make them useful and whatever. I put the bed in, but I'm not going to make a whole blown renovation. Because I'm going to be here only for two years, right? Mm. Maybe four years, right? But if I'm actually living in this place for what I think would be a long time, if I'm investing in it, if I'm owning it, then I'm going to make more of an investment. And that's how we treat everything that we own versus everything that we rent. And mm. which means also we care. We care much more for what we own than we care what we rent. Mm. And in the digital world, it's the same. So, you know, some of the game companies are saying, how is it possible that, you know, a game like Axie Infinity or even Crazy Defense Heroes, which is now powered by the Tower Token, has, you know, retention rates that are like crazy high, like 30, 40, 50, or 70% in some cases, right? Vis-a-vis -vis the traditional games, which have like single digit low, low percentage of retention. Well, that's mm. because in the traditional games, we're all renters. You know, I have nothing holding me back. I don't own anything. So I can just switch from one game to another game to another game with zero switching costs and with zero sort of uh, with zero sort of you know reasons to to not go from one place. So the only attraction is the UX. But with where I have ownership, I now have a vested interest in that success. I come back more. I have an emotional attachment that is deeper as well. You know, not just because it's financial, but because it's one that I own a piece of, just like when you own a house in a place uh, or in a country or in a city. And, you know, these these paradigms are very sort of deeply human for us and, and important and meaningful. Yeah, and this, this, this concept of true ownership is fascinating um, because I think that, that that is the the paradigm shift from, um, you know, having an account that logs in to a character that you have zero ownership over versus one that you actually do have ownership over and ownership expressed in the ability to freely trade it in an open market. Um, and look, for me, the next step, and it's what I'm trying to do with my current game, is to actually be able to create interoperable uh, assets that, you know, you can play it on my game, but, you know, maybe there's like a consensus that we can come to format-wise with games like, you know, Sandbox or Decentraland or whatnot, where my avatar can easily go over to your avatar, uh, you know, your avatar system, et cetera, because it's all basically the same thing, right? FBX, right. OBJ, you know, it's like, you know, there, there's like a, you know, there's a common standard that could easily be agreed to over time so that assets can interchange from one way to the other. And that's kind of how I see metaverse. Hmm. It's a lot more like in the style of, you know, where the word comes from, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, where you walk into the black sun and inside the black sun, there's avatars of all types. You know, there's yes, avatars sure. that are black and white, photocopied, really low fi. And then there's avatars that are absolutely gorgeous, you know? And yes. um, yeah, no, no, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. So just to go back to the Web3 thing for one more second, because I, I'm learning a lot here myself. Um, the, the idea of true ownership as it relates to uh, web, um, is, you know, can you give me a kind of like a practical example versus something how it works today versus how you think the Web3 layer can change the delta of it? Okay. So, I mean, let's take some actual applications that, that took place as an example, the paradigm of ownership, right? Yeah. And first of all, let's just step back a bit for maybe for some people who might not have the full back context, which is once data sits on the blockchain, it's a public, it's a public good. Right, mm -hmm. which means that we can compose on it freely 
with the permission of the owner of it, which is the one who owns the asset. But that you can't do when it's sitting inside Facebook or sitting inside EA or sitting inside Activision. I don't have access to the data. I can't compose anything without permission. In fact, and even if I can access it, it's probably with APIs that give me only restrictive access, if at sure. all, right? So, so that basically means that we have restricted access and we are always at the control of others. So the important thing now is that the data paradigm, which is the resource of the metaverse, as we would call it, uh, is basically now available and open and openly composable to all, right? So that's step one. So what does it mean? Well, it means now that, uh, and to your earlier point, there could be standards, which I think will help sort of create less friction in terms of interoperability efforts. But you know what's great? They don't have to be standards. Someone mm. can inv sort of innovate a new adoption. I could take, you know, basically, you know, a sandbox land and incorporate it into a new game that I'm creating. And I could do whatever I wanted with it. And I never have to get permission from sandbox. I just have to get permission from the owner of sandbox, right? Mm. You could actually literally create a parallel sandbox if you wanted with the assets and create another world that is experienced slightly differently. And actually in that environment, everyone still gets to benefit because the original owner of the, of the sand sort of sand land would still be able to get more value perhaps in another world, right? And the innovation and ideation that people add, like for instance, whether it's lending or fractionalization or whatever, is just one new level of composability that adds to the network effect of these assets. And so it means that the uh, ownership of these assets allow you to essentially benefit from the growth of the value which comes from the enhanced network effect within it. Mm. A platform like Facebook, you know, what makes it valuable? It's not the fact that we're giving it free data. Yes, that makes it valuable. It's what they make from the value. They create mm -hmm. an awesome network effect, right? Because that knowledge that they create from the you know, social graph, as they call it, is essentially the network effect of knowing what we want, who we like, all the connections that come from it, and even predicting our next moves, right? You know, and selling us advertising and all the things that they do. They right. own that. They own that. We don't own any of that derivative. It's literally the equivalent of, you know, if we were sitting on a piece of land and had lots of oil, we let Facebook extract the oil and sell it as <laughs> sell, sell, right, sell, right. sell the derivative of that, and we get nothing for it because we don't know that it's valuable, right? So, so basically, in this construct, we're able to own a piece of that, or we should ought to be we ought to get paid for that. So, let's talk about an actual real example that happened: Axie Infinity. You know what made Axie Infinity big? Axie Infinity didn't become big because. They, you know, they made a great game that worked very well from a financial sort of economic, um, sort of economy standpoint. However, it was a very small game. Uh, and then what happened was is that a number of people who owned Axies in the Philippines, who were not necessarily shareholders of Axie, nor did they have a business plan or partnership with Axie to say, let's open up the Philippine market. Let's do a marketing campaign. You know, classic Web2 gaming companies would enter a market in that fashion because they want mm. to promote it. There was just owners of Axies in the Philippines essentially renting it out and then saying, hey, this is interesting. This could make money. This is actually a great social model. And they built their own guild system and guild model on top <laughs> of the ownership of their assets and others. And they mm. never had to talk to Axie Infinity for permission to do it. They could just do it. And so the point is this. In a decentralized ownership, people can innovate new businesses and services. And they did that. And actually, that caused Axie's explosion, not because you know, Sky Mavis in Vietnam thought of a business model that basically would enter the Philippine market. Actually, it's because other people composed a new experience that made it very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. And we see this today you know, in all things. For instance, if you look at the iPhone, actually, one of the interesting things is what made the iPhone popular? The iPhone became really <laughs> popular because of video games, because sure. people saw the ability to make a new kind of content that was more accessible. And then, you know, the top charts were all, were all mobile games, the popularity of those devices. And then the fact that people could customize it as well added desirability to the iPhone. So Apple, Apple's sales of iPhone actually was enhanced through the network effect of other people because of the ownership of people's iPhones. The, mm. So effectively, ownership of these digital assets became a platform in and of itself. So this is this is where it comes. So if you make a game and you're building it open and you're building a community and that's great, actually where the magic is that someone else in your community or outside of a community might say, you know what, I own these assets. I think I could do this experience or this game or this application. And what it will have is a sort of you know potentially exponential effect in in your in your game or your 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 universe that you're building because of the fact that they've innovated an experience that you had never thought of. Of and, course. And this is the power of 
you know, like the human imagination and innovation is, is, is actually, if you unleash people's ability to be creative on top of the work of, that you've built, so much more will happen, right? I remember people used to say, nobody will go to YouTube and watch productions because Hollywood and production produce things will always be bigger. And right. Where, where are we today, right? Right, right, right. Um, you know, one thing, uh, first of all, this is fascinating. I'm, tomorrow morning, I'm telling my entire team, I'm, I'm changing already a few things because this is, this is very, very productive. Um, one, one, one question I have, is there a distinction in your mind between what you define as quote unquote open versus the kind of traditional open source software uh, philosophy that's been around for quite some time? So I think they're interrelated. In, me, in fact, many of our thinking around sort of um, ability to openly compose came from the open source framework. We were very big supporters of open source in the early days and continue to do so. There is only one thing about, so, so, you know, so I would say that with open source, you know, the frameworks are similar because you can compose new code on top of others. And in fact, it's because of open source that, you know, we are here in the world mm -hmm. of Web3, that you can have Google, that you can have Xiaomi and Huawei and Lenovo and all these amazing technology companies that have emerged uh, because of the fact that they could build on top of open source. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you know, while open source has now this incredible network effect of other people developing code on top of it, only a small subset can benefit the ones who know how to code. And so right. inadvertently, we've created a new elite, right? They're not necessarily the financial elite. They are the coding elite, the yeah. people who know how to write code. And, you know, if you had told me 20, 30 years ago that people would find that software engineers working at Google might possibly be considered, um, they might possibly be considered, you know, the bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like I was, I, to me, that would have been absolutely unthinkable because, you know, we were like everyone else. We were writing code and we were trying to right. make ends meet. And suddenly, you know, we're, we became the privileged class because we knew how to work on code and, and use open source and become startup entrepreneurs and all that stuff, right? So it wasn't inclusive enough because most of us didn't know how to code. So with, um, you know, NFTs and blockchain, actually, I, I, our sense is that this whole similar principle and paradigm of openly composing on top of the work of others now becomes more broadly accessible because it's dealing with art and culture and, and it was just with culture and with media and so on, mm -hmm. which we all understand better. So, which is, which we see today, you know, with artists and musicians and game creators, everyone who's entering into, you know, Web3 uh, and what we describe as the open metaverse allows for that sort of composability to stand out. So that means when we say open, it means that you have to build in a framework that is decentralized. Mm -hmm. If you're building in a framework that is closed, right, then ultimately <coughs> you you know, there's always a possibility of abuse and also it's generally permissioned. And so we don't generally like that. Um, but what we feel is that if you build open, then you get the benefits of open, which is like, oh, you know, uh, sort of uh, participating in like the you know, global trade, right? And the effect that has is that you'll never look back. And that's what we've seen today. Everyone who actually builds open sees the benefit and never looks back. Eventually the weight of people building open is going to be so large that even the closed ecosystems that are out there that are so large are forced open, as we have seen in the real world. And is this part of the charter of Animoca uh, brands um, that, you know, their products like have to check that box of being open for you to even consider it being part of your uh, yes. uh, you know, family of brands? Absolutely. Because the challenge for us is, you know, if you don't do that, then everything else we've invested in doesn't get to benefit from it either. Mm. Right. Like, like if I'm, if, you know, we've invested, for instance, in NFT lending platforms, how can they work on a permission platform? Right. It doesn't work. So they don't benefit. Right. If I, if I, you know, like a, as an example, right. Or if I'm, you know, having a sort of gaming guilds and the gaming guilds want to be able to sort of, you know, buy assets and use them and pledge them and rent them and sell them or whatever it is that they need to do, but it's permissioned. How mm -hmm. can they do that? Right. So it doesn't work. If I, if I can't trade my assets on OpenSea, for instance, you know, what's the point, right? I don't, I don't actually own it, you know? Um, and so we are exposed, we have over 150 investments in the space, including the ones we're building ourselves, like Sandbox, right? They're all open. So we as a company are constructed to only benefit by being open, right? And that's why we can only really invest, if you think about it, we created a framework that reinforces our own values in, mm -hmm. in a financial way. That's very interesting. So I'm, I'm actually a Sandbox user. Um, I, um, Thank I you. like the game very much. You know, um, I've collected a lot of ducks. You know, I um, I like to play sandbox. But 
you're kind of blowing my mind a little bit because the experience that I have on Sandbox currently is that if I wanted to, you know, let's say I owned a plot of land, which I don't, but let's say I did, and I wanted to um, write to that plot of land, that I would have to go through the editor that's currently provided on Sandbox. But what I'm hearing you talk is that the long-term vision is that I don't actually have to follow the constraints of the actual sandbox kind of engineering, uh, you know, uh, uh, parameters that, yeah. that that there's a more open way to think about it. Well, so the parameters that Sandbox has built is the first experience for you, which mm -hmm. is to build the voxel builder, the game builder, in a very amateurized way that everyone can participate in. Is frankly, I think one of the you know big reasons why Sandbox is so popular because it is yeah. accessible to everyone. The tools yeah. are there. It's However, also a very beautiful looking game. So congratulations. Yes. I think it's it's very pretty looking game. Thank you. Um, but you know what? If you want to go a level deeper, you could take the ownership of your land and do something different. Mm. It's yours, right? If you wanted to create a game that you know was able to use sandbox land to grow flowers in a new paradigm, nothing stops you. It's your right. land. I can't stop you. I can't say, well, you shouldn't do it this way. It's your land, right? So you could repurpose the land in a thousand different ways, in ways that we may have never imagined. Mm -hmm. And that's what's powerful. Is but that... what happens to the landowners is that there's more utility, which means the land becomes has more network effect, which means it's more valuable and therefore should be encouraged. And, and with, with Sandbox in particular, um, as far as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Sandbox is built on top of the, uh, the Unity engine. So as, a, so as a sandbox experience, it's built on top of Unity. That's correct. So is there any kind of, because Unity obviously, you know, founded by Mr. Hagelson, it's a beautiful company. Um, David Hagelson, um, who's, you know, a great guy. I met him years ago when I worked at Atari. Um, the, the idea of such a progressive kind of technological paradigm shift like sandbox working with a kind of a traditional license-based, you know, platform like Unity. Is there any disconnect there or is that no, something? No, I don't think so. And I think this is an interesting question because it lies, it's sort of underlying is what we would define as a metaverse is the ownership paradigm. Mm -hmm. What is the ownership? Which is the fact that I own essentially the land. How sure. you experience the land is a layer, right? Mm -hmm. So Unity is one way to experience, you know, your land. But you know, if someone was going to build an experience, maybe it's us in the future, you know, with Unreal, for instance, then sure. you could experience land with Unreal. You know, when, when sometimes people sort of uh, say, oh, isn't the metaverse, you know, just, you know, AR and VR? From our perspective, AR and VR are layers in which you can experience the metaverse. Yes. But without ownership, without the paradigm of property rights, all of this is meaningless. So as a foundation, you know you own your land. How you experience it, you know, is, is, uh, is, is up to you. You know, I don't know if you remember games like Ultima Online or... Oh, some of God. The... Oh, please. Yeah, right? you know, Richard yeah. Garriott is like, you know, like right. I have a poster of him in my office. Yeah, he's yeah. a hero. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, those are the classic good old games that we just like poured hours of our life in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, you know, one of the things that a lot of traditional gaming guys sort of, sort of, sort of uh, sometimes have difficulties imagining, which is kind of curious because technically game designers are supposed to be the most imaginative people in the world. So <laughs> right. I, I just feel like, you know, why can't you imagine this? But, you know, just because the sword in Ultima Online looked very sort of, you know, ancient and, and sort of, let's say, dated, right. doesn't mean that the representation of that sword could not look beautiful in a community-built game that might take all the assets and the users from Ultima Online, you know, to create... I don't know, Ultima, sort of the ultimate online experience, whatever that right, may be right, that they're building, right? right? right. But, and, and, but now I have a way in which I can access every ultimate online, uh, Ultima Online player because I know his assets. I know who has it. And I can say, come to my new game, experience it. You, maybe you want to fund it. Maybe you don't. Maybe I got someone to help build it. But you can experience it in a decentralized ownership uh, sorry, paradigm. You know, if Fortnite actually went out and said, all of our skins now are on chain, or you know you could all use it, right? How many game companies would incorporate and support Fortnite skins? Exactly. Like exactly. everyone would, right? Because they're like they're, those are customers that we might get, and of course in the Web three paradigm, you know the demand for those skins might go up, but more importantly, revenue would also go back to Epic. So everyone kind of wins 
but of course that is, that's not how they construct it so it doesn't work but that's basically where this comes from you know nobody said that a racing car inside um, inside you know rev racing had to be represented as a car in another game it could be a buff it could be a shield it could be a sword yeah, you know yeah, it's yeah, whatever really the interesting and and i think the the agency of the change doesn't come from the original game creator and this is where many people because they're always built centralized so they're always thinking about all the parameters and if they suddenly lose control of the parameters it freaks them out they're like wait wait, wait i can't possibly think of all these permutations it's going to break that's the point you're not supposed to think of that. You're supposed to release it to the wild and yeah. let the community create something, which they often do, as we've always seen in the case of UGC. In the gaming world, this was Minecraft. How many games started literally 15 or 20 years ago and are still growing? The two mm. biggest games in the world are Minecraft and Roblox. Sure. Incidentally, none of these games come from traditional game studios. And why is it big? Because it's community-driven. But every traditional gamer will tell you, Minecraft's not really a game. It doesn't look very beautiful, and neither does Roblox. And yet more people play those games than anything else because new inventions and ideas and innovation are built on top of that, even if the economic paradigm isn't the same. You know, because of the open source nature, you, know, you can go to Mindplex, you can go to download a mod, you can do all these things. It keeps the systems alive because mm -hmm. of community engagement. So the value is far greater than, you know, just like the car example, than the sale of the game itself. It's the entire community that you're that you're joining and buying into. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, you've really opened my eyes to something that I think, um, you know, and I consider myself a pretty hardcore gaming dude, you know, like I worked at Rockstar, Atari. I've been around the block, had my own gaming companies, I, you know, whatever. But I think today is the first time I really understand that what you're talking about is really that the web three open metaverse paradigm is really about truly about the ledger about what's keeping the database uh information of the assets and then the layers of how you interpret those assets is what goes on top of that and there you start getting the unity of the world the unreals of the yes. world the code of the world but that if what you keep open is that underlying uh, uh, database of assets, then you can use all that information like, mm -hmm. like, you know, like loot box or whatever that, you know, that one NFT is. Right. There's, there's certain data in there that you can interpret. I mean, even my avatar right now, if this was Spider-Man, I would get a, you know, like blocked off YouTube and Spotify and Apple Podcasts, And I'd be, you know, like I right. couldn't do this, but because this is an interpretation of the data that's on my board ape nft i'm able to use it in other you know ways it's a very very interesting way of looking at it that's actually changed the way that i understand it because i'm sorry go ahead go ahead no well i i just give you an example in practical terms if you remember what happened to OpenSea and looks rare right mm -hmm. oh i, I mean please, please don't talk to me about looks rare I, i'm yeah. i'm so underwater on that right now yeah <laughs> Well, I, I'm not talking about investing here, right? But, but the concept of Luxware growing as a marketplace by giving a benefit to every person who oh, traded on brilliant. OpenSea. Brilliant. Well, but but imagine you can't do that in Web two. It's like right. it's like it's like it's like because your entire data layer and your ledger is open. So sure. that, you know, even though it's not an NFT, it allowed someone else to essentially create an experience that may or may not be superior. But that's not the point. The point is that I can now compose an experience to the benefit. Of an audience, uh, you know, basically right. to bring him on board, and I don't need permission. It's like if you know, what would the world look like if Amazon had all of its data open for the world to compose on? Not that they right. would ever do that. Right, We'd actually right, have right. so much more invention and creativity and ideation that would take place because people can say, "Wow, with all this data, right. I can make maybe customized services or something beautiful or something whatever, whatever, right?" Because it's available for everyone to compose on, and tap in, instead of this entirely walled garden that exists in pretty, pretty much everything that's web too, right? So that's what's beautiful uh, about this, and you know, it looks rare or SOS or these may not have been the most successful implementations of the thought, but they demonstrate that you can do that. You know, the fact that you have a board ape, um, I can now provide a service to every ape holder in the world, right? right. Um, and you can say, come to me and I will give you something or I will give you an experience or you can yeah. enjoy a game I made just for you. I mean, this is one of the most powerful community engagement and customer acquisition tools that you can think of. And it makes Absolutely. you, as the owner of the asset, a platform yourself, as opposed to you have to go somewhere 
like an Apple or Spotify that tells you what you should consume, right? Yeah. In fact, you're now, people are coming to you because you own it, which is how the real world actually works. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. In my game, Club Metaverse, um, we actually have an entire team that all they do is take the NFTs that we support um, and, you know, we create 3D avatars of the all the different traits, you know, yeah. that, you know, that are going on. You're doing if it. You if you connect your wallet uh, to our game, you can play as your NFT that you already own and your NFT has the same utility that all the NFTs or, or that all the avatars, you know, have. Um, oh man, this has been fascinating. I, I feel bad because I'm already four minutes past my allotted time with you, but, um, yeah, you know, there has to be a part two to this conversation because I feel like I'm a thousand percent smarter. So I feel like this has been a one way kind of value proposition, but, um, this has been a humbling, humbling chat. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Um, is there anything that you kind of want to say, first of all, you've outlined a vision for a true utopic future and it's really impressive that this is the charter of you know and the mission statement of your company that's um really inspirational to me and i appreciate that is there anything that you want to talk a little bit about about where you see this going into the future or kind of what you wish to see yeah sure so i mean first of all thank you um it's a great pleasure and i think one of the things that we always love to do is talk to people about how we see the future because mm -hmm. i do see this as a solution and why we're so passionate about it is is a solution to really rebalance a lot of the inequity in the world that we see today. Mm -hmm. The inequity in the world isn't just happening because of, you know, there's many reasons, right? But the inequity is, is, is happening because there is a lot of divide that's happening in the digital world in a different way. You know, the, the biggest companies in the world, they own our data. And in fact, if you think about it, we are all laborers today in the metaverse, just not yeah. in the open one. Every right. time we use Facebook, Every time we play a game, every time we're using Instagram, who are we making richer? Who are we making more powerful? It is the platform. What do we get for it? Right? So we are living in an age where we're, being, where we're digitally colonized and we're serving the kings. We are serfs. Right? And so wow. what happens <laughs> if we unlock this and do what happened in history where we went from a medieval feudal society, which is what I think the digital world is today in Web2, and bust that open to create capitalism and a democracy, as we have seen, an unlocking of economies that are worth trillions, but also a liberation and a new kind of freedom that I don't think we can even comprehend today because we've never existed that way digitally. We appreciate our freedoms physically, but we don't know what it means digitally because we can't value our data. You know, we think data and data ownership should be a human right, should be a property right, because if we treat data as property, the paradigms change. If you use my data, you have to pay me for it, like property, or at least you know give me equity or a piece of the action because mm -hmm. you've used it, right? How much value would we generate if you know the big Web two platforms had to share the so you know you know from the success that they've had from our data that we provide? Because after all, if we stop using Facebook today, what is the value of Facebook? Nothing. And by the way, that's true for every game in the world as well, right? So, so this is what this unlocks, right? And so we see this as the pathway of the future of work. We see this as a way in which we don't talk about the future as a paradigm of maybe we need universal basic income. We think this is about where we can all have equity as a kind of universal basic equity because we are the creators of this data. We are the creators of the resource of the open metaverse. Therefore, we are the ones that actually can make our own equity and I think this is, you know, the future when we build. And it does sound utopian, but you know what? I mean, we have a chance to make it happen. So let's go for it. It sounds utopian, yes, which is typically um, a kind of, you know, a hubris in literature. But I don't think any of the writers that fell into that trap had a chance to talk with you yet, because um, I think you broke it down pretty, uh, pretty logically, you know, because it's all about in a world where the biggest companies on the planet are mining us for data, kind of like in the matrix. Yes, uh, correct. You, you know, um, there is a new technology that has emerged and is creating serious disruption in the industry that actually is built on granting you those true ownership and property rights that you're talking about. And it's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you've given me a lot to think about. Hopefully you've given the listeners a lot to think about. Yeah, um, is there a place to find you? I mean, obviously you're the, you know, you're the 
you know, the head honcho. I don't want to use the word CEO because are you not the CEO? You're well, I'm chairman and co-founder of Animal Brands. Yeah, yeah, yeah chairman but, and co-founder. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but it's yeah. I mean, we're all kind of working together as a team. Animal Brands is not a small startup, right? We have many people oh, helping, helping things, uh, helping uh, sort of grow the space. Yeah. Um, but you can find me. You know, I think I'm most active on Twitter under my handle um, YSIU. So if you want to, uh, and I also have a Medium blog that I don't update as much as I could because writing does take time, but I enjoy doing it. And that's where I share a lot of our thoughts about where we think the future is going and, and why it's, why it's really important. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And look, also um, if you love, uh, you know, games and you want to check out what I believe is the most advanced true NFT blockchain game out there, I think it's sandbox and there's a great community. You can go to the club and hang out in the club and dance around and look for Easter eggs um, it's a great game. Thank you. And um, hopefully I will see you guys very soon. Thanks all for listening. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.